my second vlog. I'm doing something a little different than last time. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a film. And the reason for that is that uh, filmmaking is obviously very important to me. I actually wouldn't have made the business to begin with if I wasn't interested in films. So from time to time I will talk about films, uh, just discuss them and uh, talk about the, the context around it. Um, and I've got my brother Nathan with me today and uh, he's going to be uh, well talking to me about this film. So uh, actually Nathan, why don't you talk about what film? Okay, so we're, yeah, we're, the other night we watched on Netflix, The Other Side of the Wind, which is uh, Orson Welles' last film completed about 40 years after he died because it wasn't able to be completed in his lifetime due to a lot of like financial and political social factors that weren't involved. Um, and yeah, it's a kind of, uh, kind, of, kind of meta film about this director who's trying to complete his last film and he's kind of being surrounded by all these critics and all these other colleagues of his um, in his face filming him from more different directions and Wells doesn't actually, he's not actually in the film, he doesn't play anybody, but you do kind of see this uh, representation of Wells at a very um, kind of maybe dark time in his life towards uh, towards his last days. Yeah, um, the uh, the director depicted in the film is actually, uh, it's supposed to be the last day of his life, he dies at the end of the film and at the start, of, it's a circle plot in a sense because he's, at the start of the film you're already aware that he's passed. Yeah. And, um, uh, I mean, just this morning I was actually watching the documentary that accompanies it um, on Netflix. They made a, a documentary that's about the making of it and well, it's more about Wells' career overall as well, but focusing on the other side of the wind. Um, it's called um, They'll Love Me When I'm Dead, which um, uh, I'm not actually sure is... Uh, a, lo a lot of colleagues of Wells denied him actually saying that, but I, I think it's a very um, uh, telling quote about him, a uh, very interesting quote, but the director in the film is, is said to be uh, autobiographical, Wells actually denied that, but just about everyone says, yeah, it's autobiographical, <laughs> and, and, it, and when you watch it, it's very obvious about it, and people working on the film, uh, because a lot of times it'd be dark and things like that, and I'd see John Huston, who plays this director, they would see him, like, oh, is that Wells, and like, oh, no, it's actually just, <laughs> he's like, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, I, I just sort of wanted to talk about um, where the other side of the wind falls in Wells' career and then uh, how it not so much shapes up to the rest of his films, which I think is not fair, but um, uh, how he actually came to make this film. And because um, I'm a big Wells fan myself and um, I'm, I really like Citizen Kane. And uh, Nathan doesn't like it so much. No, <laughs> overrated. But that's, that's, that's a Sorry, <laughs> yeah, that's a topic for another day. But um, yeah, uh, I think the problem that unfortunately for Wells, he was he said himself that Citizen Kane was a curse. Yeah, to him definitely because um, every subsequent film he made would always would always be compared to Citizen Kane, um, which, like I said, isn't really a fair thing to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, but Nathan, what do you think about, uh, the style of The Other Side of the Wind? Like, because essentially it's a film within a film because, uh, it's about a fi an art film that's being made by the director in the film and then the footage is like documentary footage from journalists, colleagues mm. and all kinds of different... Yeah. So what, what what would you say about the? I thought style? It, it's it's very much a jarring, like vivid kind of experience where um, I, I again I found it very similar to F of Fake, which was kind of his I guess yeah, the last film he completed in his lifetime. Um, where it's just like I couldn't imagine that hundreds of hours they would have had a footage that the people at Netflix and all the people involved would have had to cut that together and be like based on the script and his notes and what Wells himself said about it to be like okay this is the film that we're going to make this is the film this is closest to what we can get to what he wanted. And whether, and it's weird, it's weird to think of a director like doing that kind of style to imagine how they would see, if, if maybe he had sat on it for 40 years and was like 2018, okay, I'm going to finish the film now. If like the current climate of the world or, what, or America or whatever, if that would have changed the way he made the film or if he indeed would have gone, I don't want to finish the film, I'm never going to release it. I wonder if, if what 2018 with Orson Welles 
uh, behind a camera would be like, you know? Yeah. I think it's very interesting, because I, I actually just found out today that when I was watching that documentary, there was um, countless other films that he didn't complete, mm. not because he didn't want to, but because he just, he want, he didn't want to release it as it was. Yeah. And um, uh, I remember seeing an interview with him, and he was talking about, um, uh, I, I think he was asked something like, um, uh, does he like seeing the film when it's done? And he goes, no, because once it's done, I can't change it. Yeah. So it's, yeah. I think it, he was very much uh, trying to perfect it over and over again. And that's why, um, I think that's unfortunately, among other reasons why Other Side wasn't actually completed because um, he just wasn't happy with it yet. Yeah. That, and that also goes on to another thing, like a sort of larger question, is the film we watched, how how close is it really to um yeah what he would have wanted uh people to see yeah so um, yeah well, what do you think about that I think again I don't know I don't I can't really go into his mind or yeah think, of and, and I I, I to to to, yeah. to to be honest I really haven't seen that many of Orson Welles films but I do think when you talk about this feeling of is the director so much there is the creator of this work so much there I didn't feel it as much as with say. Citizen Kane, where Austin was, it, it, it is all him, you know what I mean? Like, it's not... Yeah. Whereas I thought in this one, John Huston was a very um, uh, kind of powerful force in why the film was so great. I thought his performance was, was very much there. Whereas in, like, Citizen Kane, in the script, in the dialogue, in the cinematography, especially the cinematography, in everything, you, it's just well as well as well as well. It's all... That whole auteur thing really is, is there. But um, the other side of the wind, I don't know, the fact that maybe going in with this... Uh, foreknowledge that you know it hasn't been completed by him it's been uh, assembled by a whole bunch of different people some of them who never even knew Wells in his lifetime um, to be able to do that okay the name is there okay the credit's there okay it's Wilson Wells' film but when you think about it do you think he's really there I didn't think he was present the whole time but there were some really intimate bits I thought with the director as in the director the main car, the main actor that did feel like, wow, this kind of seems like it's about Wells himself and a lot of the criticism he felt and a lot of the questions people were asking him, always trying to explain his work and keep asking about Citizen Kane, which was like ages earlier and he was kind of like, well, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I want to talk about other movies I'm doing now. I don't want to be always just the guy who did Citizen Kane, you know? So that must have been hard, I think, as he got older in the late 70s, you know? Yeah, I mean, I remember saying to you when I first watched it that it, it, it felt different to other Wells films because... Um, like the ones he made, I mean the ones he yeah. directed, because uh, I think all of them either star him in it, has him star in it, um, whether that be in the main role or not, but he still plays a large role in it, um, or he narrates it, like in um, uh, the Magnificent Amazons. Yeah. But um, this one was a little different, and I think the only chance we get to actually hear him uh, is off screen. He's uh, interviewing. Uh, like one of the characters in the film yeah uh, but actually I just found out like just after watching that doco um, he hadn't actually cast John Huston yet while he's when he started filming so the, I think the reason the only reason we do hear him in the brief time that we do is because any parts that uh, the director John Huston's character who's um, uh, just I, 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 forgetting I, the name. I, 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 yeah, I just I, I just watched the. Doctor. But then you think, but then you think, it's, I keep thinking um, it's Wells. I keep thinking it's Orson Wells, well, and that's yeah. not his name. <laughs> Regardless, so it, yeah. Um, any any parts in which he appeared in, uh, Wells was actually uh, acting, basically acting out the character off screen, yeah. because um, Wells also thought that the, there was only two people who could have played that, himself or John Huston, and um, he said. Uh, giving the role to John Huston was the most uh, selfless thing I've done in my life because, <laughs> because it, it, I, I mean, even yeah. though he keeps denying it wasn't autobiographical that film was essentially about him yeah. and the more I learn about it the more that, that's true especially the relationship between certain characters in the film yeah. um, uh, like uh, Peter Bogdanovich's character mm. who is playing himself as well essentially yeah. so um, yeah, we've sort of gone off topic. What were we actually talking about? Um, the style and why, oh, yeah, yeah, and whether, like, and then and, uh, if it was the film we wanted him to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, just to see. on the style, um, the 
it's sort of like I, I can't actually think of anything earlier than that but like it's it is somewhat almost like a found footage film yeah. when you look at it that way especially like the way it's been made now that sort of they've collected all the film uh and even though some segments already edited a lot i'm pretty sure a lot of them weren't so yeah um, uh and what was interestingly gets uh, uh credit as an editor which i think was kind of strange considering well no i don't think so because yeah. i think a lot of the, he had already edited a lot of segments so yeah um, and would have i guess written notes and like this goes here this goes yeah. here this cut, this cut, this cut. Yeah, he was, yeah. He was very meticulous about his editing, and yeah. you can see that as well. Like the, the cuts are very. Well, it's like with uh, that film Touch of Evil, where he wrote, wrote how many notes on what he would have wanted the film to be edited yeah. like, and then they went and yeah, did I a mean, new cut um, of that. Uh, so like Touch of Evil, uh, I think they only released a like director's cut afterwards after Wells died. I think sometime. I think for a DVD release or yeah, VCR like or something. Or something. Yeah. yeah, that that's the cut I've seen. I haven't actually seen whatever cut they released. Um, in the 1950s or yeah yeah we went whenever touch of evil was made but um uh yeah i think i think what they did the touch of evil uh, originally when he just uh essentially got fired off ed the editing it that sort of left him pretty bitter about hollywood which also comes into the storyline of other side of the wind yeah um like a director returning to to hollywood yeah it's, it's um uh, was, yeah, yeah, I was talking about the style. Yeah, the style. Yeah. Um, uh, it's that yeah, like that found footage sort of look. Um, and I, I it just reminded me of something very interesting that Wells said, and he he said that essentially the director's role is to preside over accidents, and a lot of it was unscripted, so he was almost not improvising, but finding uh, just finding magical moments to yeah. capture. In the film, he just had like almost like a circus of people there, yeah, and that who were characters, and then that would sort of branch off into, um, to stories, and the the actual actors there, like a lot of them were just like, what are we doing? What's happening? Like I don't even know. John Huston himself, he's like, he's just like, oh, I have no idea what this. Was. Yeah, <laughs> I have no idea what he's doing with yeah. this film scene. But yeah, uh, yeah, which is why I think when you compare it to something like the production of Citizen Kane, I think was very much a, very fine-tuned, thought-out, scripted, meticulous, uh, ordered... Com yeah. I'd yeah, say I mean, with little improvisation on, yeah, on uh, part of the finding magical moments, and that would have been very much a clear, driven, creator-style um, mm. piece. And because and when there's that much money in the line for his first first outing in Hollywood, which went on to get so much acclaim, um, when you've got such a big budget on your hands and so many actors and crew and everything, you can't really afford to take the creative liberties he probably took in his later life. Yeah, well, I mean, even Citizen Kane, he had, uh, like, a remarkable contract that's um, unparalleled to, like, anything other films have made. Like, he, the, the amount of uh, control he had over the film yeah. was um, incredible. He, he, um, in his contract, he, he was the only person who had the rights to see the dailies, which are obviously the, um, uh, the bits of film that are being filmed on the day, at the end of the day, it's where people will see... The dailies and um he was the only one who had the rights to actually see mm. that normally the producers the uh basically stakeholders and heads of departments they they have the right to see the dailies but wells was the only one who got to see that so yeah. um uh he, i mean he financially i don't think citizen kane was um anything of a big deal no uh, not really this time i mean um like gone with the wind like yeah couple years earlier that's um, that was had, huge had a, had yeah a far bigger budget i'm yeah. sure um and probably, oh no, in fact, did do financially, Very well the box office, yeah. financially a lot better than Citizen Kane. Although I would argue that the Citizen Kane has held up. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's where we can disagree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's aged a lot better than Gone with the Wind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what was I, I, keep, I keep going on a tangent. We were talking, talking about, talking about um, style. <laughs> style, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, you were saying about improvisation, the magical moments. Oh, direct, yeah, yeah, Directing yeah, the film. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Unscripted. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think that Wells sort of went in there with that mindset of like, oh, we'll just get some cameras and we'll make a movie. Not th I don't mean that in that he did... It was That's what people was, think improvising yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it was unplanned. I think in his head he knew what he wanted, just no one else on the set did. Yeah. So, um, and people dread a director like that because then you go, I'm scared well, yeah, of yeah, mis yeah. miscommunicate on the set, which is going to cost money, it's going to hurt feelings, it's going to cause issues in the story. You know? And the, the DP, he, he I mean, he loved Wells, but he... The, he came 
uh, very close a lot of times to leaving, and then Wells would somehow talk him out of. It must have been a nightmare to shoot to be yeah, and, cinematographer on that and, film. And um, for for that, uh, he because they weren't really making any money, uh, he had to just every now and then the production would stop just so like key crew members could actually yeah. feed their family and just eat essentially. So um, uh, that that's and same with Wells, he obviously had to work you know a couple of uh, like commercials and mm. uh, to keep other it going yeah. and stuff like that just to keep the production going. Um, and when he won the uh, AFI Life Achievement Award, he essentially was, um, it, it's quite sad really, he was, he was almost begging to uh, someone to finance it so he could complete the film. Mm. Um, which actually it runs parallel to the story I see in the film. Yeah, where he's running when out of someone, money. Yeah, when, yeah. when he's running out of money himself and he's trying to uh, get more money from the studio. Yeah. I said how you don't often feel his presence there. However, having said that, I mean, as a director, I don't feel his presence so much there. But in saying that, there are times when some of those handheld camera shots, you could almost think it's Wells himself doing it, getting up close there, doing these really yeah. crazy, intimate, um, uncomfortable kind of shots, getting in people's faces, kind of, I guess, what he felt people were doing to him mm. in his life. Uh, him always being questioned or um, criticised or whatever um, for people asking all these questions about art and, you know, oh, could you explain this? Could you define what, what this art's all about? Um, so you can you definitely feel that cynical kind of view of his um, there with a Super 8 camera with his eye on the viewfinder there. I'm sure there's probably photos of him act doing just that yeah, yeah, yeah. on the I, set. I mean, so just, I'd love to see more of that yeah, behind the that, scenes. Watching that docker, you yeah. see him like a lot there. But I, I, whether or not that's actually the footage from the film yeah. or not. I wouldn't be surprised uh, anyway if, yeah. that, if there were maybe one or two shots where Wells, you know, step to the side and said, you know, I need to do this shot myself or, oh, give me the camera. I'll, I'll shoot something, you know, like, mm. uh, and there's no, nothing wrong with that. There's no, um, uh, it sounds like, again, he was looking for magical moments and sometimes you can only do that by looking through the viewfinder. So, yeah. Um, I will sort of close on this, but I mean, I know you haven't watched too many of Will's films, yeah. um, but how do you think it fits in with the rest of his, uh, career? And do you think it's a, it was a good end? I'd say, uh, yeah. oh. if if you want to say that, because well, I mean, yeah. it was technically yeah. his last film. Well, it makes you that, that makes you think of Kubrick, which I think where, where I think Eyes Wide Shut was a great, a masterful end to that, to a very long and fruitful career. Uh, I think with Wells, um, it's probably it's maybe maybe a kind of cool thing that it's forty years after *Effect Fake*, and it's kind of there was this t passage of time that where other movies came out, and new styles emerged, and other directors emerged and stuff, and then there's like oh, 2018. Or Wells is still coming back with another film, you know. He's, yeah. he's still relevant, and Orson mm -hmm. Wells is still relevant, you know. Um, that kind of creativity doesn't die. So um, I think it definitely fits well as a closing chapter of his. Just that last line, you know, the, to spoil, but uh, shoot him dead. I think um, you know <laughs> there couldn't have been a greater line of you know like narration to end Orson Wells's filmography, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But anyway, guys, um, thanks for watching. Um, if you've bared to sit through all this, but um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll be back next week for another vlog, so, um, yeah, stay tuned. Cheers.